So third, first Samuel chapter 16. So we know what happened in, in the case of King Saul. Uh, King Saul was anointed as well. Um, in fact, let's go to first Samuel chapter 10 and let's look at when King Saul was anointed. Okay. In, in the Old Testament, there were three types of people that were anointed. You had the prophets, you had the priests, and you had the kings. And to be anointed, what it basically signified is that you uh, were being prepared for a ministry uh, for God, that you were being separated to do the work and the will of God. And in the time of Samuel, um, Samuel was a judge. Okay? In, in those times in Israel, they only had, had judges. Samuel had two sons, and two of those sons were bankrupt. They were corrupt. They, they were fraudulent. So basically, the people of Israel rejected Samuel's sons as being their judge, and they cried out to God, and they said that they wanted a king. So God hearkened unto their request, and God prepared a man from the tribe of Benjamin who went by the name of Saul. So King Saul was the first king of Israel. But for, for Saul to operate in the ministry that God had prepared for him, he had to... Um, sorry, he had to be anointed. And the same thing applies to absolutely every one of us here. If we want to do the work of God, if we want to do the ministry of God, we need to be anointed. But the anointing of yesterday will not suffice in the anointing of today. So that is why we read in Psalm 92 verses 10 that David said, thou shalt anoint me with fresh oil. And what he understood is that there needs to be an anointing every single day. Now, Jesus Christ, the Bible says that Jesus Christ was anointed with power and with the Holy Ghost who went around doing good and healing those and delivering those who were oppressed by the devil because God was with him. But Jesus was born of the Holy Ghost. He, he was actually conceived of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost came upon his mother and that is how he was formed in his mother's womb by the Holy Ghost. But notice that Christ could not begin his ministry until he was baptized by John and until the Holy Ghost came from heaven and anointed him, it, it smeared him, it, it saturated him, it baptized him. And the same thing applied when uh, the apostles, when Jesus Christ had been risen from the dead, Christ told them, he said, he said depart not from, from Jerusalem until you receive the promise of the Father. And he said that not many days hence, you shall be baptized, you shall receive power. In fact, let me, let me get that scripture up. Acts chapter 1 verses 10. Acts chapter 1, verses 10. So Christ instructed the, the disciples, he said, don't move, don't leave Jerusalem, don't start preaching, don't start doing any ministry until you receive the promise of the Father. The promise of the Father was the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So Acts chapter 1, verses 10, or verses, verses 8, it says, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, after the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. God's plan for every single one of us here is to have an international ministry. God wants us to reach the four corners of the earth to proclaim Christ and to proclaim his, his power and to demonstrate his power. But Jesus Christ knows that the only way that we can do such a thing is if we first wait and receive the Holy Ghost. Now, back in those days, perhaps they had to wait. Perhaps they had to tarry. They had to wait until the day of Pentecost. That was the time that God had ordained that he would send his Holy Ghost upon the disciples. But in these latter days, all we need to do is to cry out to God. All we need to do is to be desperate. All we need to do is draw near to the Lord in faith, in holiness, and God will pour out the same spirit that he poured upon the apostles, upon the disciples on the day of Pentecost. The Lord God can pour that spirit upon us every single day. Every single day is an opportunity to be born again. Every single day is an opportunity to receive the Holy Ghost again. Now, let me, let me stress something, that there are different operations of the Holy Ghost. So I think we've already touched upon the fact that you have the Holy Ghost within you but that the Holy Ghost can also come upon you and that they have two different functions. When it comes, when it comes within you, when the Holy Ghost comes and lives within you, it's for the, the sake of uh, uh, creating Christ in your life. It's for the sake of 
making you righteous. It's for the sake of you bearing the fruit of the spirit. It's for the sake of you developing and growing in love, growing in patience, growing in temperance, etc. But when the Holy Ghost comes upon you, as it did on the day of Pentecost, it's for the sole purpose of demonstrating miracles, signs, wonders. It's for the sole purpose of demonstrating the gifts of the Holy Ghost. It's for the sole purpose of demonstrating the power, the authority of the living God. Now, Jesus said he will not leave us nor forsake us. And, and verily, that is true. I don't believe the Holy Ghost will leave us or forsake us. However, there, there, we still need to be baptized afresh every single day of the Holy Ghost. And it is only by being baptized by the Spirit every single day, be, you know, having a fresh outpouring of the Holy Ghost every single day, that we're able to have an active, daily, powerful ministry in Christ. You see, when you look at the, the apostles, they understood the power of daily. The apostles understood the power of daily. Acts chapter 2, it says that they fellowship steadfastly daily. They broke bread with one another daily. They had fellowship with one another daily. Acts chapter 5 said that they went to the temple and taught the word of God daily. So they had a revelation that for them to walk in signs and miracles, for them to walk in the promises of Jesus. Remember, Jesus had promised them that you will trample upon scorpions, you will trample upon serpents. He said that the enemy, the power of the enemy will have no, no power over you. He said that you will raise the dead. He said that you will cast out devils. They understood that the only way that this would become a secure reality in their lives is if they understood the power of the daily. They understood that they needed to fellowship daily. They understood that the prayer of last week, the fast of last year was not sufficient for today. So what they did is they, they as Paul said, they said that they, they, they died daily. They subjected themselves to the spirit of God daily. They obeyed the word of God daily. They read the word of God daily. They taught daily. They listened daily. They learned daily. They did everything daily because they understood that the only way to receive a day-to-day -day anointing, a day-to-day -to -day touch from God was if they learned how to sacrifice on a day-to-day -day basis. Jesus said that you must take up your cross every day. Luke chapter nine, if you come with me, to Luke chapter 9, verses 23. Jesus speaking in Luke chapter 9, verses 23, says, And he said to them, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Remember in Lamentations 3, 23, it says, uh, that that had it not been for the mercies, for the compassion of our Lord, that uh, we would have been swallowed up. That His mercies are, are are new every day. Let me get it. I think I'm I'm not quoting it perfectly. So it's Lamentations after the book of Jeremiah. Lamentations chapter three, verses twenty two. It is the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Amen. So God is doing something every single morning. God is doing something every single day. And there needs to be a, an alignment for us every single day. Every single day, God has a specific purpose, a specific plan, a specific will regarding our lives. And what he had in plan for us yesterday or what he has in plan for us today is going to be different to what we have in, what he has in plan for us tomorrow. Because the Bible says that our time on the earth is 70, 80, perhaps even 90 years. So the Bible says that our, our time on the earth is like a vapor. It, it, it's, it appears and it suddenly goes. So how much more will, will God want to do in every single one of our lives every single day? Every single day is an opportunity to find out what is the will of God for my life today. We may have an understanding of the overall uh, purpose that God has for us. We may understand that, look, it's my purpose to become an apostle. It's my purpose to become an evangelist to the nations. Oh, it's my purpose to set up this business and to be a generous a giver in the things of God. It's my purpose to raise up these children in the ways of the Lord. We may have all 
of us here may have a general perspective of what it is that God has called us to do. But for us to actually get to that destination, we need to find out what is the day-to-day -day step, what is the day-to-day -day plan, what is the day-to-day -day purpose that God has for me. Because God may tell you you're going to be an evangelist to the nations, but before you become an evangelist to the nations, God may have to take you to the wilderness. It may be a season where you go into the wilderness, where God is calling you to pray, where God is calling you to fast, where, where God is calling you to separate himself from the streets. And then the next season, it might be that God is calling you to go to Bristol or God is calling you to go to Manchester or God is calling you to go to London. And then in the next season, it might be that God is calling you to spend time with your family, to spend time with your friends. But the thing with God, and this is why we are not religious people here, we are spiritual people here, is that we don't follow rules. I mean, we follow commandments, but we don't follow rules with regards to how to deal with God. We, we serve a living God. And this living God speaks. And what the living God may say to me may be different to what the living God says to Emmanuel, because he has a different plan regarding all of our lives. And none of us here are religious. All of us here are sensitive to know what the spirit of God is saying regarding our lives. But for us to be able to hear what God is saying, we need fresh oil. We need a new oil. Amen. We need a new oil. The oil from yesterday, the oil from last week will not make you sensitive to what God is saying today. Do you know that, God's does not do, that God doesn't do the same thing over and over again? I know in Ecclesiastes, Solomon says that there is nothing new under the sun. I know that Solomon says that the thing that was yesterday is the thing that is today, that there's nothing new under the sun. But in the book of Haggai, it says that the glory of the latter house shall be greater than the former. And in the book of Isaiah, it says, behold, I do a new thing. So what God did 100 years ago is not necessarily what God is going to do today. God is good. With God, God does greater things in each generation. So I know we're looking back to Elijah. We're looking back to Moses. We're looking back to the apostle Peter. But God wants to do greater things in our generation than what he did in their generation. Even Christ confirmed this. Jesus said that if you believe in me, the works that I do, you will do them and greater. So even Jesus was a great encourager for, for greater. So how do we become greater in what God has called us to do? We need a fresh anointing. We need a fresh oil. You see, the path of a Christian is a path of growth. The path of a Christian is a path of growth. That is why quite often uh, the apostles and Christ use the symbol of a bay. To, 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 to illustrate the, the journey and the growth of a Christian. When we become born again, we are like children. We are like babes. That is why uh, Peter said, desire the sincere word of, of, of God like milk so that you may grow. That is why Paul, when he was rebuking the church, he said that you guys are yet carnal. You are babes. That is why Jesus said that there are many things I can say unto you, but you cannot yet bear them. Because when you first become a Christian, you, you are like a babe. Paul said that when I was a child, I spoke like a child. I fought like a child. But when I became mature, I put away childish things. So the way that we were last year should not be the way that we are today. There should be growth in every single one of our lives. But the, only, the power that God uses to bring about growth in our lives is... Not only the word of God, but it's also the anointing. It's the anointing. And what God wants in every one of our lives is that the anointing grows. It gets stronger. It gets stronger. Do you know that it is possible that you can have a stronger anointing 10 years ago than what you had today? There are people in the Bible, and that's none of our portion, but we need to, we need to understand this to, to, so that we can see that the anointing does not just naturally grow. You know our bones, they naturally grow. You know our teeth, they naturally grow. You know our bodies, they naturally grow. But the difference between the, the natural birth and the spiritual birth is that the nat with the natural birth, there are natural things that go on in your, in, in your body that bring you to maturity. And you have no control over them. They just happen. Provided that your parents are there, they're nourishing you, they're giving you milk, they're giving you food, they're giving you a, a warmth, they're giving you the necessary things, you will naturally grow. In the case of a Christian, in, in the case of spiritual growth, spiritual growth does not naturally just take place. For spiritual growth to take place, you actually have to want it to take place. And that is why 
if you read throughout the Bible, the one thing that God has always been calling these people to do is to draw closer to him, to draw nearer to him. Because it's only by drawing nearer to God that you can actually undergo spiritual growth. There are people in the Bible like King Saul, which we're going to read about very soon. King Saul initiated this path, initiated this journey of becoming a man of God. He was he, he was born again, essentially, because the spirit of God came upon him. He was, back, he was um, anointed by, by the prophet Samuel, and it says the Holy Ghost came upon him. So the spirit of God was moving upon Saul. But in the case of Saul, because he didn't understand the importance of, of the, the fresh anointing, because he didn't understand the importance of a, a new oil, all of that went down the drain. In fact, Saul, if you, read, if you read the life of Saul in, King, in, in the book of Samuel, his life, it went downhill all the way, all the way until he died. The man ended up killing himself. Who would have thought a man of God who was anointed by the Spirit of God, the first king of Israel, would end up taking a sword and killing himself? He was on the battlefield. before The day before the battlefield, he went to consult with a witch. And... This is the same man, when, he had the, when the, the oil came upon him, the anointing came upon him, the Holy Ghost came upon him, he's the one that made the decree and he said that all witches, if you don't leave Israel, you're going to be put to death. That's the decree that, that Saul said. He, he banished all of them. And then who would have thought a few years down the line, because he has no fresh oil, because the anointing has gone, now the anointing's gone, he has no power to become righteous. Now the anointing's gone, he has, the people around him weren't respecting him. The people around him weren't listening to him. The people around him, they were going to David. Even his son, even his son, Jonathan. Jonathan was following David. Why was Jonathan following David? Because David had the oil of God upon his head. David had the fresh anointing. The anointing wasn't on Saul's head anymore. So nobody respected him anymore. So he went to, go to the witch. The witch said, uh, you know, when he went consulted to the witch, Samuel, a ghost, you know, some people say he's not Samuel, some people say he's a ghost, came up and said to him, look, the Lord said that tomorrow you're going to die. So he went onto the battlefield against the Philistines. The Philistines were defeating Israel. He went to his, arm, his, uh, his, uh, his assistant, his, arm, uh, his armor bearer, and he told the armor bearer, kill me. The armor bearer refused. You won't believe it. Saul got his own sword and he stabbed himself. He's killed himself. You see, when you don't have fresh anointing, the decisions that you make, it kill, you, you, you end up killing yourself. You, you look at Christians and you say, why are Christians making these decisions in life? Why are, Christians, why are Christians ending their lives prematurely? Why are Christians destroying the plan and purpose that God has for them? It's not their fault. It's not that they, that they want to do that. Nobody wants to destroy themselves. Everybody wants to preserve themselves. But it's because where you don't have the fresh anointing, you don't have the oil in your life, you cannot help but be self-destructive. We look at the people of the world and we're saying, why are the people of this world making these destructive decisions? They're taking drugs. They're, 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 they're um, doing all different type of things. They're stabbing each other on the streets. Why are they living this type of life? Because they don't have anointing in their life. When you have anointing in your life, you, you will live a good life. But this anointing that I'm speaking about is not the anointing of 10 years ago. It's the anointing of today. It's the anointing of tomorrow. It's a fresh anointing every day. Samson is another man that found out that the anointing of last week will not help you today. This is why the Bible says, be diligent, be sober, because the devil goes around every day like a lion seeking whom he may devour. God used Samson one week the Holy Ghost came upon him. He, 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 the anointing came strong upon him. They put him in chains. The anointing came so strong upon Samson that the chains around him, the metal chain, began to melt. They put chains on his hands so that he couldn't move. The anointing just came upon him. The chain melted. His hands were free. He then got a, a bone, a bone of a donkey. And with that one bone, he killed hundreds of people because the anointing was so strong upon him. The anointing will come upon him. He will pick up a gate of a whole city. He will lift up the gate and he will throw it down when the anointing came upon him. But then when, when he was getting comfortable with Delilah, he, again, he didn't have a revelation of the anointing of last week. The anointing of last year is not enough for the anointing of today. You need fresh anointing. You need fresh oil. He didn't have anointing with, with, when he was with Delilah. 
So what happened? Delilah came in. The devil used Delilah. And the devil had his way against Samson. Samson ended losing his eyes. That's what happens when you don't have fresh anointing. You, even your vision, your vision is blurred. You, you stop having visions. You stop having dreams. You, you, stop, you start losing focus for, the, for what God has called you to do because the anointing has gone. The anointing has gone. Why do we think that when we read about Jesus, Jesus is always praying? He's always praying. He, you, know, you know, in Mark, in fact, let's go to the scripture so I can show you. Mark chapter 1. This is, this is the secret to Jesus' power. Is it because he's the son of God? Yes. But why did he have so much power? Because he had day-to-day -day anointing. He had fresh anointing every day. Mark chapter 1, verses 33 to 30, 39. Mark chapter 1, verses 33 to 39. It says, All the city was gathered together at the door, and Jesus healed many that were sick of diverse diseases, and cast out many devils, and suffered not the devils to speak, because they knew him. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place, and he prayed. And Simon and they that were with him followed after him. And when they found him, they said unto him, All men seek you. And he said unto them, Let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. And he preached in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and cast out devils. Amen. So you see, in Jesus' ministry, he was not only a teacher, he was also somebody that casted out devils. He casted out devils, many devils from people's lives. People are going through things in their lives. And the reality is, is that they have devils in them. And the devils are afflicting them. The devils are causing poverty. The devils are causing diseases. The devils are causing mental, uh, mental illnesses as well. And without having a ministry where you can cast out devils, then your ministry is not going to be as powerful. Okay, apart, apart from casting out devils from people, Jesus went around and he healed many people. He healed many people. So he wasn't just a teacher. He, he, was, a, he was a man of signs. He was a man of wonders. He was a man of miracles. He had a very supernatural ministry. And that is what separates the greatest ministries from those who have good ministries. The, greatest, the, great, the people that have the greatest ministries are often the people that move in the supernatural. The people that we refer to as great men of God in the scriptures are people that moved greatly in the supernatural. Think of Moses, think of Elijah. These are people that did supernatural things, things that we cannot quite understand by the human mind, things that God had a, 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 an important part to play in. But how did these people move in the supernatural? They moved in the supernatural because of prayer. They gave themselves over to prayer. In the story we've just read in Mark, Jesus Christ had done many miracles, but instead of going out with them, playing around, you know, having wine, you know, drinking with them, uh, eating with them, having feasts with them. We see what Jesus Christ would always do. Whenever Jesus Christ did an, a miracle, whenever Jesus Christ did something amazing, he would always separate himself from the people, go back into the wilderness, go back into the secret place, and he would pray. He would spend time with the Father because he understood that, look, if God is telling him, okay, tomorrow I need to go to Galilee, or tomorrow I need to go to Jericho, or I need to go back to Jerusalem, to the temple and preach there. He understood that the only way that he would, he would move accurately, the only way that he would move in signs and wonders is if he spent sufficient time with the Father in the night or early in the morning, praying, praying, praying. And by being in the presence of the Father, the Lord would then download a fresh anointing upon him, a fresh oil upon him, and then that would give him the grace to then go about doing the works of God. Amen? So... The only reason why Jesus Christ moved in the miracles is because he understood the, the value of prayer. He understood the value of fasting. We saw in the case of Jesus, before he began his ministry, he did 40 days fasting. No, no, I believe he had no food and he was there in the, alone with God. He was praying, he was praying. After those 40 days, he then came out and there were so many miracles that he did in his ministry. People were perplexed. They said, what mighty man of God is this that has arose? They didn't see that, or they didn't see what happened behind the scenes. They didn't see that the, that the, that the, the secret behind Jesus' power was fasting and prayer. 
Jesus even said that there are things that cannot leave our lives except we give it over to fasting and prayer. The, I believe the quickest way to receive fresh anointing in our lives every single day is by fasting and prayer. Now, I'm not saying that we, we fast to the extent that you don't eat at all. We have to be sensible. Sometimes God may lead us to fast without food. But the fast that we can do that will ensure that we'll have fresh anointing in our life is a six to six. I believe that's a powerful fast to do. Having liquid between six and six, breaking at 6 p.m., limiting maybe your, you know, your, 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 uh, your meals to maybe one or two meals a day, and then praying instead, in, instead of eating at 12, instead of eating at three, going into your Bible, reading the Bible, instead of uh, eating at, at 12, eating at three, going uh, you know, to a secret place, praying in the spirit, praying in tongues, for some time. When you do that and you do it over a period of time, by the time you get to 10 days, six to six, by the time you get to 20 days, by the time you get to 30 days, you get to 40 days of doing that, you'll know that something's changed in your life. You, you will feel it. You will be hungry for God. You will not be given over to temptation. The temptation, the things that you would say, that the times that you rise up in gossip, the times that you rise up in anger, it won't be happening as often as it did before because you, you, you've cried out to God and you said, look, Lord, the reason I'm doing this is because I want a fresh anointing. I want a fresh impartation. Now, as I said earlier on, we're going to go back to King Saul and look at the life of Saul. And we see in the life of Saul, he was anointed once. But we're going to compare that to the life of King David and see that God has a, a new anointing for you today, my friends. My brothers and sisters, God has a new anointing for you today because there is something that God wants to do in this next season. We're still in 2021 and there are many more things, even as we move into 2022 and things that we're going to see in 2022 as well, not just 2021, but things that, we're, that God is going to do in our lives in 2022. And God is saying, prepare, prepare for the next year, prepare for, for, by getting a new anointing. And the anointing that God wants to give us is a, is a stronger anointing, is a thicker anointing, is a powerful anointing. You know, the devil hates anointing. The devil hates anointing. Devils, demons, they hate anointing. Unrighteousness hates anointing. Some of us, we've been given over to fasting and prayer. And as we've been fasting and prayer, there's been spiritual attack. There's been spiritual warfare that's going against us. Do you know why that's, why that's happening? Because Satan knows that as you get this new anointing, as you get this fresh oil, that there are, there are, there are doors that are going to be opened that your, 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 this, your, uh, your forefathers were never able to access. And the devil is scared. The devil is afraid because the devil knows that what God is doing in this new season of your life is going to put him to shame. The devil knows that not only are you going to walk through that door, but you're going to bring many in to that door through with you as well. The devil is afraid of that. So we need, we need the anointing. It is only by the anointing that you can break yokes from your life. Isaiah chapter 10 says that by the anointing, by the anointing, and let's go to that, that verse, Isaiah chapter 10. If Christ needed the anointing, we also need the anointing. Acts chapter 10, 38 says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with power and the Holy Ghost, who went around doing good and healing those who were oppressed from the devil or by the devil, for God was with him. Jesus Christ needed to be anointed with the Holy Ghost to, to become what God had called him. We need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Acts, um, not Acts, sorry, Isaiah chapter 10, verses 27. And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden, this is the burden of the devil, the, the, the burden of the devil. Sometimes we feel heaviness on our shoulder. We feel heaviness on our backs. The burden of the devil the burden of Satan. And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off your shoulder and his yoke from off your neck. And the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. You see, the way to bring about deliverance in our life is the anointing. But to receive the anointing is a cost. The anointing is the most valuable, the most valuable thing in the world. It literally is the most valuable. I'm telling you, my brothers and sisters, I would not lie to you. The anointing is valuable. The anointing is more valuable than money. The anointing will give you money. If you want, if you want wealth, get an anointing. The, anoint, the, the anointing will give you promotion. Look at Daniel. Why was Daniel promoted all the time? Because he had a very thick anointing upon his life. How be it that Daniel became, 
You know, when Daniel would interpret a dream, they'll give him gold, they'll give him silver, they'll give him purple garment, they'll give him everything he wanted. They would give him maybe half of the kingdom. Why? Because of the anointing. How did Esther move in such influence, in such authority to the extent that she became the second most important or the most, one of the most important people in the whole realm, in that whole kingdom? Because of the anointing. Esther said, okay, what I'm going to do for a whole year, before I stand before the king, I'm going to, I'm going to bathe myself in frankincense, in myrrh, in all of these oils. She had this oil that she would put upon herself every single day. She would wash herself, clothe herself in the oil. What is the oil? The oil is the anointing. She understood the value, the importance of the anointing. So that when I tell you that, that the devil will not be happy with you desiring a new anointing, I'm telling you guys from experience. I'm telling you from the scripture. Why did Satan come to Jesus when he was fasting? Because because he knew that God was going to pour a strong anointing upon his life. A strong anointing upon his life. That's why. Why did You see, it's so sad. When we read about when people fall, when we read about Samson falling, when we read about David falling, do you know why I reckon they fell? They were probably in a season where God was going to put a stronger anointing upon them. So Satan saw it in the spirit and he got afraid. He got afraid. So then he brings temptation into your life because he does, he can see the spiritual realm. You know, you know, as a prophet comes to you a pro in the old time, when you wanted to get anointed, a prophet will come to you and he'll pour oil upon your head. That's how Kings were anointed. When, when, uh, when David was anointed, Samuel will come and anoint him. You see in the spiritual realm is angels. Angels are like the, the prophets, you know, of the spiritual realm. And angels come and they literally can deposit oil into you, into your life. They can, they can deposit fresh anointing into your life, the angels of God. So, that, so Satan can see that in the realm of the spirit. So Satan knows when you're about to receive an upgrade. Because when you're about to receive an upgrade, God will send a strong angel. You, you may have a guardian angel that has been with you from, from, from a young age. But when God wants to do something big in your life, he, will, he may send a bigger angel. He may send Michael. He may send Gabriel into your life. So Satan can see when God is sending those high-ranking angels into your life. So when he doesn't, he won't hear the conversation between Gabriel and God. He won't hear the conversation between Michael and God, but he will put two and two together and he will say, okay, if Michael is coming to, uh, you know, to Emmanuel or Michael is coming to Jasmine or whoever it may be, then God is doing something in that person's life. So then he resists you. He brings temptation. He, he tries to discourage you. He afflicts you. He sends all of his legions to attack you in the night to discourage you because he doesn't want you to receive the fresh anointing that God has for you in this next season. Jasmine, you wanted to share something. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, thinking about the anointing, anointing will, I mean, it'll, it'll cause you to call things out of the spirit realm into the natural. The, the anointing will lead you to the right people, to the right ministry, so that you can be a blessing to people. But it all starts with obedience. When we disobey God, when we crucify Jesus over and over again, when we defile ourselves, our anointing starts to leave little by little. And that's why you see some men and women of God in destruction. And it didn't start with whatever we see them falling in at the time. It usually started with something else really small. And then they started to disobey more and more and their anointing left more and more. And that's why we have to be so vigilant and really stop and think about how what we're doing in the moment, our actions will affect our anointing because God has to be able to trust us with his promise, with our promise. He can't give us thousands of followers and then we embarrass him. Because do you know that some people, some people dislike the fact that we follow God because they hate God. They're like, she follows that imaginary God. So they will intentionally try to get you into a situation that they know will destroy your witness and then turn around and talk about you behind your back. And then people won't take you seriously. And then they won't take God seriously. So yeah. we have to make sure that we're representing Jesus in everything that we do, especially yeah. if we know that we've been called to do yeah. big things for the kingdom of God, because um, we want to be able to go to the distance and um, lead people to God and be consistent with our anointing and be consistent with our promise. Amen. You know, the Bible says that he, is he that is faithful with little is also faithful with a lot. So when we're, when we're faithful with the little anointing, and every one of us has an anointing, the Bible says that you have received an anointing and it abides in you. And you need not one to teach you. 
what that means is that you don't that God teaches you himself because he lives within you. So he teaches you what is right. He teaches you what is wrong. When we became a Christian, nobody needed to teach us that this is wrong. We knew because the anointing was within us. When we're faithful with that little anointing, then we grow in the anointing. Mm -hmm. When we grow in the anointing, we grow in the results. We grow in the influence. We grow in how much of God is deposited within us. Because each of us carry a measure of God. Each of us reflect and manifest an aspect of God. With Jesus, he was so heavily anointed. This man was, Christ was so anointed that he was able to actually manifest the fullness of who God is. Every one of us has the opportunity to do that. But as Jasmine said, it's about being obedient. The reason why Christ was heavily anointed throughout his whole ministry throughout his whole life was because he was obedient to God. It's by our obedience that we grow in the anointing. It's by our sacrifice. The people, of, the people of witchcraft, they understand they have their own anointing. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, it, there is a demonic anointing, but notice in, in Ezekiel 28, it talks, about Satan, uh, it talks about a fallen angel. Some people say it's, it's Satan. And it's, they call him, it says, thou art the anointed cherub. Thou art the anointed cherub. And it's talking about an evil spirit, an evil angel. But that angel is anointed. So anointing is not, you know, anoint, you could be anointed with demonic power. <laughs> anoint, you know what anointed means? Anointed means to be smeared. It means to be rubbed, to be saturated, to be covered. So when you say you're anointed by God, it means that you're that God is covering every aspect of your life, that you're saturated with the fragrance, with the presence, with the wisdom of God. That is what an anointed means. And anointing is the only, the only way that God can use somebody is if they're anointed. When God uh, uh, told Moses to build the tabernacle, all of the materials, all of the utensils, all of the plates, the forks, uh, the incense, everything that was used in the tabernacle and later on in the temple in the time of Solomon, the priests had to go and rub oil upon it. They had to consecrate the material. Even the, the temple itself, they would consecrate all of the materials for the, for the use of God. So if that applied then, how much more in our time? For us to be used by God moving forward, we need to be anointed. Guys, we've got two minutes. We're going to close. Um, but what I will do is on Saturday, I will continue this, um, this teaching on the anointing. Um, I'm just going um, gonna to close there, going to close it in prayer, and I will leave it for tonight. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for this time of fellowship. We thank you, Lord God, for your, your presence that's been here. Uh, we thank you, Lord, uh, that you are giving us this new anointing. And Father, we just pray, Lord, that this anointing that you, you're pouring into us tonight and indeed until tomorrow as well, Lord, that it will be a sustainable one, Lord. It will be mm -hmm. one where we desire to have fresh anointing every day. Mm -hmm. Lord, we just pray that we will not be distracted Christians. We'll be Christians that seek your face above all mm -hmm. things, that seek your will and that walk mm -hmm. in your will. Father, we, we, we put our lives into your hands, Lord. We cannot become who you want us to be unless you play an active role in it, Lord. So we just, we, we beseech you, Lord, that you would have grace upon us, that you would favor every single one of us here, Lord, that you would give us the, the sure mercies of David, Lord, that even as Jesus Christ grew in grace, in favor, in wisdom, Lord, I pray and I decree that every one of us here would grow in grace. Every one of us here, would grow in wisdom. Every one of us here would grow in stature. Every one of us here would Amen. grow in favor, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And I just pray, Lord God, Amen. that as we've spoken of men who they dwindled in the anointing, that will not be any of our portion in the name of Jesus. Amen. But as David Amen. grew in the anointing, as Jesus grew in the anointing, that will be our portion Amen. in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord God. And we Amen. pray, Lord, that not Amen. only will we grow in the anointing, that we would teach many other people, Lord, to grow in the anointing also, in Jesus' Amen. mighty name. Father, we pray, even as we read about Isaiah 10, verses 27, 
where you said that the anointing will, you know, because of the anointing, we will break every burden, every yoke off our shoulder and our neck. I pray that we will be yeah. so heavily, heavily anointed, Lord God, that sickness, that death, mm -hmm. that affliction, that, that impurity, it will not even be able to, to, to be anywhere near us in the name of Jesus. It will not have any rights near us, Lord God, that it will flee from us in the name of mm -hmm. Jesus. And Lord, that with the anointing mm -hmm. that you will give us, Lord, that we will be used to deliver many people, Lord God, to deliver them from pain, to deliver them from heartbreak, mm -hmm. to de deliver them from affliction. Mm -hmm. In the mighty name of Jesus, Father, I pray that we will be completely whole in the name of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. We will be completely whole mm -hmm. and healed. In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord God. And I pray mm -hmm. we will not look back, but we will march on forward mm -hmm. to receive our due reward in the kingdom to come. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. God bless you. Thank you.